endoscopy in progress with radiology facilities and this is of course image sorry endoscopy reprocessing we can touch on the spot with quite modern equipment and, and the doctors and nurses are given certificates at the end of the course now Solomon Islands are much entirely different from from Fiji population is just under over 500,000 uh, and the main hospital is called the National Referral Hospital. They do not have a medical school. And actually this program was started, or linked with and Peter was started because of approach by an American vascular surgeon. Her name is Arlene Natuzi, she's from California, and she developed links with the Solomon Islands because her uncle was on the American battleship, battle cruiser Quincy, which was sunk in the Battle of Guadalcanal. So because of that, her family have maintained links with the Solomon Islands and she tried to recruit both American gastroenterologists and, and Skida was interested. So we have endoscopy nurses and gastroenterologists visiting now, all the endoscopy there is carried out by general surgeons. So, all the doctors here are general surgeons, as well as nurses. And so, what is arranged is we let them know that Enskida will visit and we collect all the fairly difficult patients so that there's an ongoing uh, uh, discussion and training at the same time. The procedure, the capital equipment is mainly supported by the American government. And of course, this would be the nurses with Thai Jones. Now, Myanmar, the, the, because of the time uh, limit, I think I might have to skip over some slides, if you don't mind, because I thought I had a little more time. Uh, you all know the population of Myanmar and that Yangon General Hospital is the main teaching hospital in Yangon. And it's now incorporated <coughs> as the Medical <coughs> Myanmar Training Center. It all started in 2013. And since then, there's been three programs. The first in 2014, second in 2015, and the third, the current program. When, we, when I had discussions initially, there were re renovations ongoing at the Department of Gastroenterology and we had our meeting where the endoscopy endoscopes were stored actually and th between this slide where we had the meeting in December 2013 where you'll see many familiar faces here and this slide when we had the first program there was an interval of only about five or six months and in between there was another one or two meetings, but also separate meetings here and also back in Australia. So we finally got a very strong team of doctors and nurses to set up the first program here in Yango. And the, all the attendance and the program was arranged here and all the training was done uh, jointly actually. Now this is Dajo, she's actually an authority on uh, infection control in endoscopy. So the interesting point here is that the lecture is to both doctors and nurses. So that's what we try to uh, maintain all the time. We, we had to use at the time, as you know, uh, lecture halls in various venues. And this is Dan Jones with the endoscopy nurses who, of the Young Rodian Hospital. Now at that time the equipment was being moved around and this is a picture just to show this is Professor Finley McRae who should be joining us shortly. And then we came to last year and last year was quite <coughs> important because uh, I'm showing you only pictures of uh, group photos and you might think that's all we do take group pictures but uh, that's not the case. That's, it's just a record and that's the Asian way of doing things I think. Now, this was when the YGH was uh, inaugurated as the WGO training center. Now, to reach this stage, it needs a lot of groundwork and information statistics, etc. And 
we are delighted that we are part of this assistance. This is Professor Jim Dooley, who is actually a colorectal or general surgeon, who became head of uh, president of the WGO, and, and we now have a more dedicated lecture room in the Yangon General Hospital with an audience which is with a very well recognition room. Now, I'm just going to, this is the nurses being taught uh, reprocessing. And I just want to, this doesn't show that everyone has become Australian citizens, by the way. <laughs> now, this is, this is the, this is, how many minutes are we? How many minutes do I have? Huh? Pardon, okay. This is, we are doing the third training program and we are already discussing, discussing plans for the next program. This time the training is emphasis on colonoscopy. And <coughs> surgeons are attending and lectures are being kept into one group. Now, I just want to show you the last few slides of the participation of Ben Skeeter and our uh, uh, host countries in the recent GE and WTO International Congress last year. We have a stall there and the doctor in front is, when I took this picture, he hadn't decided, but he's part of the and, uh, Australian teachers now, Dr. Uh, uh, <laughs> Dr. Rodriguez. Uh, Dr. Rodriguez, yes. Now, there was a separate uh, WGO session where the training center representatives did presentations, and including Professor Tenyan. And most importantly, this is what I want to share with you. We had two senior endoscopy nurses from Yamaha who joined in and who gave separate presentations to the nursing sector of the WGO region. One, Noah Lydia, and the other, uh, Sister Klein from Tinganya Sabia Hospital. Now, they gave very, very good presentations about the state of endoscopy nursing, gastroenterology nursing in Yuma. The talks were very, very well received. They shared uh, the Nema into the world uh, sort of uh, gastroenterology and TI nursing area. They shared a lot of information. They shared information about all the workshops and international meetings that have been held here, and it was very well done. Now, and she did always have an annual meeting and dinner where we invite all the representatives of the various training centers to join us, and this would be the Fiji continent for this year. And this is just my last slide of the western entrance of the Shri Kumbhakota. Now, I won't talk about the political significance and the religion, religious significance of this. But that's all I have. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you for your presentation. So um, the Q and A session will be uh, also will be depending on the time. So we invite second speaker. And uh, when it comes to management of malignancies in the GI tract, not all the patients are suitable for undergoing surgery. In that case, we might need to request our colleagues, GI experts, GI physicians, for their expert hands to make the GI tract better. So, Professor, we invite the uh, Professor Jin Kang Pung from Mok University, Singapore, for a presentation on stents in GI tract. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mingalama. I'd like to thank the uh, Professor Kim and his team for again inviting me to give a talk in Myanmar, which is one of my favorite places in uh, Indochina. Uh, I've been to Myanmar a few times and have many fond memories. Um, at Myanmar and some of the extinct speakers in front of us are probably featured in this photograph here at the first GI meeting. And uh, Professor Tian Min and Naomi and Tatai here looks as young as ever in this photo. And I was last year in Mendeley for ERCP workshop at, uh, with Professor Niu Ni. 
So this is in the lake. You saw the photo in the lake outside. But my this guy did a stunt for me when I was there. So I actually got on to his boat so and took a photograph of him. So without much further ado, uh, my topic today is on stands in the GIT because of a. Uh, in the interest of time, I will confine myself to, to the esophagus, um, stomach and the colon, excluding the biliary tract. Uh, we know that uh, when we first put in stents, the very first stents used were very rigid, they were non-expandable. Uh, subsequently, I think everybody agrees that uh, these uh, self-expandable metallic stents are the in thing now to use for palliation. Uh, it is easy to insert and we can use it for literally everything from the esophagus to the anus. Uh, years ago, before the use of uh, stents, uh, surgeons performed palliative surgery, but we all are aware of the significant morbidity, mortality uh, of palliative surgery compared to uh, enteral stents. So enteral stents, without doubt, is very efficacious, safe, and uh, it also appears to extend the life expectancy because probably you improve the nutrition of the patient, etc. And most of the cause of death subsequently is due to the cancer progression. I published an edit editorial on self-expanding metallic stents as well as self-expanding plastic stents in the palliation of malignant esophageal dysphagia in the annals of palliative medicine and I'll be very happy if you can read it and give me your opinion. Uh, we now use stents to palliate malignant obstructions of esophagus, stomach, duodenum, small bowel, colon, bowel duct. But at the same time, more and more of us are using it to also in the management of uh, fistula of the gut wall, perforation, and even benign strictures. Uh, the current interest is actually using stents, the lumen opposing stents, to drain obstructed gallbladder uh, or fluid collection. Uh, Self-expandable plastic stents were once uh, very uh, the in thing then you know years ago. We cause we can use it to uh, close up fistula, uh, especially that because it's removable. So the first SEPS uh, that was actually popular then was the Boston Scientific Polyflex stent. It was made of polyester monofilaments, completely covered on the inside with a silicon uh, membrane. So it's a very smooth inner mem membrane surface so that food can go through. And it's a rough outer mesh to reduce the migration, or at least supposedly reduce the migration. And a very, very large proximal end diameter. And this is the picture. I'm not sure whether you're familiar with this uh, polyflex stand, which is now probably not used commonly anymore. It is very useful because it is removable. So this is the early uh, study on the use of SEPS and found to be quite efficacious to treat fistula of the tracheal esophagus as well as esophageal leak. However, it is very complicated assembly to set up. It has a thick, rigid deployment system and uh, the migration rate is actually very high, as high as 25% and you need to repeat the endoscopy to retrieve it and then to replace the stent so it is actually not um, commonly used anymore. So now the in thing is the self-expandable metallic stents. It is woven, it is knitted, it has a laser cut metal cylinders with self-expanding forces. It can be made of stainless steel alloys, a mixture of nickel, chromium, nitinol. It can be covered, partially covered or uncovered. You have uh, stands from many companies, uh, including Boston Scientific, Wilson Cook. Uh, the Koreans are very famous for their stands too, uh, which is mainly from MI Tech and Taewoon. And you also now, the latest is the biodegradable stands, which is the XS, uh, SX ALA stand. This is a very, uh, one of the very early stands, too, which is again not being used now. It's a isopho coin stand, single metal nitinol strand. The problem is again the migration as well as the main fracture in one case too. Boston Scientific is probably one of the pioneers in stents. He has uh, many kinds of stents as you can see, including the lumen opposing stent, the axial stent. Wilson Cook comes up with these uh, stents where you deploy using a gun and the um, advantage is that every trigger that you press, the deployment is about 6 mm and so you have a, supposedly have a good control in the deployment of the stents. 
Taewon, uh, advantage of Taewon stand that it has many, many specifications. So if you want the 12cm, 6cm, you want to uncover, you want to partially cover, they have many of these stands, including the lumen opposing stands, the Nagi stands. MI Tech has this uh, cervical esophageal stands which you can use to palliate the upper esophageal structure. So I think without doubt, there are so many papers published to um, establish the efficacy and uh, safety of the stents. Uh, generally speaking, I think we have a 90% chance of technical success. It can be performed like within 15 minutes and the clinical success ranges from about 80 to 90%. The perforation risk is usually not high, but 1%, although it may be higher in colonic stenting. I have also uh, reported the clinical outcome of stents for the palliation of malignant upper GI obstructions and again, in this paper, our technical success rate is 93.5% and um, the good thing about this is that most of the patients actually stay in the hospital in a shorter period of time compared to those who underwent uh, palliative surgery and it's cheaper and the median survival is the same as those patients who have undergone palliative surgery for the same problem. Uh, I think we I just show one um, video clip of uh, Stands, the basic stands, standing that we do. So this is the... You can't see the stands? It's not... It was working just now. Yes. So, so this is the case of a pyloric tumour. So there's obstruction there. So. To perform uh, stenting, it's, it's always the same basic principles. You identify the, the obstructed lumen with, uh, usually I will use a bortic catheter because this is non-traumatic, it's less traumatic. And after you inject contrast to confirm that you are in the lumen distal to the obstruction, like here, where I inject a contrast and you can see. So the tumour is here. This is the obstruction here. My scope is here and now I inject contrast distal to the tumour. Once you have done that, then you introduce a guide wire and